Right, I'm just going to run over the setup with you so you can see what we've got here. We've got uh, a Hewlett Packard audio analyzer, uh, 8903B, which is uh, a very accurate piece of kit actually. They're quite old now, but they still go on strong and they're accurate and good. And really, what you have is a, it's a GPIB controlled bus, so the thing's a remote controlled instrument. And on the one side, you have a high precision, very low distortion signal generator, so generating the signals to go into the circuit. And on the other side, you have a very high precision receiver circuit, uh, voltage measurement, and also a very accurate sine wave amplifier, which it goes through a very pure filter and then the harmonic distortion can be summed from the direct signal versus the filtered signal so it's a very accurate um, distortion measuring voltmeter on this side and of course you, you, you send a, a signal out on this side into the amplifier the output comes from back from on this case the speaker drive into the input side and then we can tell what the distortion is and uh, what frequency response is etc got the spectrum analyzer underneath for debugging when you've got a problem we've got a scope connected there so we can see the signals going in so when we set the reference levels we make sure we're not clipping and if you're doing a full power test you'd set the output uh, level to be just below clipping so you don't go into a clipping range when you're overdriving because you'll get just very severe distortion and then over here coming back to the, the actual test area we've got the uh, two speaker loads close that clearly they will get very hot if you run this continuously but we're just doing a quick run so they get up to sort of like 40 or 50 degrees on a full power test on an amplifier like this and on the bench today we've got the uh, musical fidelity a5 integrated solid state amplifier massive great polished aluminium <laughs> volume control and the lid is off so I'll just give you a quick tour of what's inside both the sides here this side here and side here is a heat sink and then you've got two channel amplifiers it looks like a bit of a bird's nest inside to be honest single transformer you haven't got separate transformers for each channel so you could get power supply cross talk via the transformer between uh, left and right channels on high drive levels and you've got a whole load of input filtering switching stuff down there for all the inputs and then you've got your two separate power supplies here. You've got a bridge rectifier and smoothing and then drive circuitry for the left hand side. You see you've got four big power transistors there. So here are the transistors, Allegro Sanken Japanese uh, Darlington transistors. Let's have a look at the data sheet here. Absolutely look, uh, obsolete. I don't know whether there's a replacement. I have got some of these actually somewhere in the cabinet from stuff I've done years ago. But uh, I can't recall having seen them blown. So let's have a look at the data sheet. Right, okay, so SAP series, blah, blah, blah. You see uh, built-in temperature compensation diodes and one emitter resistor. So it's a Darlington pair with some built-in components to help with linearity and also to balance the two NPN and PNP characteristics. So you get a better match of the complementary pair I'm just going to show you, uh, you can see they are, I think, that's what's inside them. There's one PNP and one NPN in a complementary pair. Class AB push-pull amplifier, always cross over problems, you know, as it crosses this point here through the center point of the transfer on quiescent current, you adjust, a, here it says, a 40 milliamp quiescent current, so there's always 40 milliamps throwing through down the chain from the positive supply to the negative supply to bias the transistors above the uh, non-linear part of the curve. There still be non-linearity at low signal levels and this is why these amplifiers, AB amplifiers, give quite a lot of THD at low signal levels, i.e. when quiet listening and also very quiet passages and more distortion than when the thing is blasting out. It's easier to get low THD on higher output levels or medium output levels than it is at low output levels that's why you would use class A instead of class AB. So it's not a great design. Um, yeah, so that's the transistor. And I probably think the schematic for this thing has been lifted straight off an application's data note published by the Japanese company. So as far as the uh, 
company's design efforts are concerned, it's really just lifting it off the uh, semiconductor manufacturer's application note for these devices. So if you need to repair one of these, have a look at the application note if you can find one, because you'll probably find it's, it's almost pretty much exactly the same uh, schematic, all right? So that's the actual transistors that are being used. A little pot down here for setting the bias so that you get the right quiescent current and get the transistors past the knee of their curve so that the changeover point between drive between push and pull is in the linear drive part of the transistor and you shouldn't get too much crossover distortion. All right? So that's the amplifier. Um, you can see it's not rocket science, it's a very simple expensive amplifier but inside it's the right bird's nest not very tidy really as to whether it makes any difference you know these days making a really high fidelity amplifier isn't difficult because you know electronics has come on a long way since we only had half a dozen valves in a circuit so there's the right side again right side bridge rectifier separately fuse loads of smoothing and your four right hand drive power transistors now you can look at the wiring on this there's um very skimpy little wires that go in between the output of the amplifier driven through that coil you can see on the right to the output connections a couple of uh, jack sockets on the back into which we've got our loads plugged in down there and same on this side you can see we're testing at the moment we're testing one input at a time uh, just to see what sort of frequency response and uh, performance we're getting on the screen and you can see there's loads again, I'll just show you the loads, that's the left load, that's the right load. This is the sense wire that goes back to the analyzer and when we change channels we change the plugs over in the back there between left and right rather than switching these over because these are okay resistors but they're not precision resistors and if there's a slight resistance difference between left and right then we'll get slightly offset power uh, readings for the for the sweep all right so that's the um, that's the amplifier I wouldn't say it's fantastic I had to make some adjustments because we had a gain issue on one side and I've noticed there's quite a lot of noise coming through from the power supply you can see this thing is supplied with uh, <laughs> a braided screen that's the that's the power cable can you believe it or not and uh, You've got a very, very flash look of mains plug there, look. Uh, with, believe it or not, gold-plated pins on the, on the mains plug. You really have to know that you've got good connections and everything's right, because performance isn't enough. You have to know that you have the best. It's like a golf player with his expensive clubs. He'll never get satisfaction from the game unless he knows he's got the best equipment. Even if he can't tell the difference uh, subjectively. So that's the amplifier we're on, we've got under test today. Oh, and on top here is the uh, P notebook which controls. This is the interface to the GPIB bus plugged into the back of the 8903B. All right. So we're going to stimulate this in a minute and drive it, and then we'll see the uh, the results of this amp on the screen, and you can get an idea of um, how you test an amplifier when you've done a repair and you're setting it up. How will you actually make sure? that the thing is the best it can be and after this I'll show you show you this one but I will show you also in the next video a really really good amplifier which isn't that much money which um, is frankly is better than this on the bench and I'd say that's borne out by listening to it as well so yeah over to the PC now and we'll just drive this thing through a few put it through a few uh, of its paces and you can see see what it does. Actually, I'll turn the analyzer off at the moment because it's just noisy. There you go. So let's go and do the measurements. Okay, so here's the utility which we use uh, to control the 903, the HP analyzer. And you can see you've got up in this corner here, you've got filters, which you can uh, set if you want to put some bandpass filtering on. To improve the performance sometimes uh, high frequency noise can distort the results but of course high frequency noise won't be reproduced by the speakers because it's way out of the band pass of the speakers and the response of the speakers so you couldn't hear it but you might be able to measure it so if you get some anomalous type readings you can put 
a filter in to try and uh, improve your readings to ref to reflect the actual performance in the application you're looking for. So we've got a start frequency up here of 20 hertz. Stop frequency of 30. Let's make that uh, 35,000 just to make it a bit more interesting. Points per decade. I usually set it to 10. So that's 10 points per decade. Now, when you start this, you obviously got to set up the ref reference level. And that's one I look at the oscilloscope to make sure that we've got a reasonable level. This generator level here, this slider or this box here, you can adjust the input voltage to the uh, to the amplifier so that you don't get clipping. And you can drive it in a sensible area. Really, you don't really bother whether the frequency response at uh, mega 150 watt output is is uh, important. It's uh, better for listening at reasonable levels. So it's best to judge it at reasonable levels, really, unless you're doing a concert or something. So if we just hit the start button here, and it says reference level okay i'm just going to cut to the video camera so you can see the reference level on the scope there you go i'm zooming in now you can see that's the reference level on the scope if it was clipping then we could uh we could adjust that i don't know whether this is uh yeah they're, they're starting to get a bit warm probably 20 watts or something going out through the amplifier We've got the volume control set to there. We can turn it up slightly. You can see if I turn the volume on the amplifier up, you can see the level on the scope. So let's give it a bit more beans just to give it a fair test, okay? Mustn't linger too long, otherwise my um, load resistors will get quite hot. All right, so that's what we've got. And if I just press start now, you can see it on the screen and we'll just, uh, I say, okay, reference level. Now it will start doing the sweep. And you can see the frequency on the scope increasing as it goes through the precise voltage is being fed into the amplifier and that's the output waveform you can see there as it sweeps through okay you can see the values on there changing now if we sweep back across to here again back onto the screen I don't know if you can see it but <laughs> it's quite flat there's this yellow line here you can see it's tracing along the top of the screen and that's the frequency response of the amplifier so we've got the reference level at 0 dBs, which it took when we took the reference level at 1 kHz, and now it's sweeping across, and we're reaching uh, 5 kHz at the moment. 6 kHz, and it's going to sweep up to the, uh, we said 35,000 Hz, didn't we? So 35 kHz, it will stop. And you can see the response to roll off there at the top of the screen. I hope you can just quite see that. I might zoom in on that on the video. Okay. I'll just do the other channel so we can do a comparison of the gain of the two channels. Let me just swap it over and we can zoom in on bits of this and you can see it uh, better, get a better idea of what it's done. Okay, so I'm just going to pause the recording. Right, the input and the output have been transferred over, so we're now testing the left channel, left channel now. So we're on the left hand channel at the same setting, so we should get exactly the same curve if the gain of both channels is identical. And there you can see it on the screen. You can see there is a slight difference. You can see the red line tracking across the screen. So the gain on the left channel is lower in the frequency response curve. So we have a gain discrepancy. It's very small and it would be, you would normally see this actually. It's not the wiring, it's not the load resistor because it's the same. It is the amplifier has got a different gain, which is interesting. But we'll we'll zoom in onto that part of the curve in a moment, and we'll just see how much it is and try and work out whether it's realistic. And you can see it's rolling off at the end at a different rate as well. So the the channels are different. So that's that sweep complete. Now if we go into here and then zoom zoom uh, in to an area let's just have a look around the one kilohertz uh, you can see it's uh, it's there is some roll off at the lower end but nothing to speak of it's uh i think it's a dc coupled amplifier we'll check the schematic in a minute and then you can see and um, we've got a difference in db of the roll off there you can see is the uh, minus 1.54 so at 35,000 hertz we've got a, 
a signal roll off at minus 1.54 db which is well above the audio hearing response for, for a human so there's nothing to worry about there in terms of the overall frequency response and we we can see here look we've got um minus 0.2 dbs all right minus 0.2 yeah so minus 0.2 what's that it's about, that's about um in linear terms probably about four percent between four and five percent down on gain on one channel the left channel's got lower gain than the right so that's uh it's not a coupling capacitor because it's linear across the range it's somewhere probably i don't know whether this uses one percent there are quite a lot of operational amplifiers in there um yeah, they're one percent resistors so if you had a cumulant you know one percent here and one percent there you could get two percent if you had two stages where the resistors were one percent out with an operational amplifier the resistors program the gain and so you could get that or it could be a loss through one of the switching lanes clearly there's um digital or integrated uh analog switches in there which multiplex the inputs based on the selection at the front panel through to the amplifiers i'll investigate that but that's a typical test i wouldn't normally bother um you can't hear that and especially on amplifiers that have got a balance control because you know you, you have to get the balance control absolutely cock spot in the middle to um the slightest movement either side you can't hear the difference and it'll move it five percent easily just by not being in the middle of the balance so not necessarily very much to worry about at the moment on that one i don't think so let's have a look at some of the other um scans we've got on this Here's the total harmonic distortion uh, versus frequency. So you can see what kind of distortion you get at various frequencies. So 35,000 and 1 hertz, 35,000 hertz, 10 points per decade. Check the reference level, which is the same as before, which is lovely. On the screen, I can see it. Reference level, OK. And let's just do the scan and see what we get. And here it goes. So this time, instead of looking at the absolute gain uh, versus frequency, we're looking at the distortion versus frequency. So it'll be filtering the pure sine wave out of the return signal and then comparing it to the total uh, return signal to get the total harmonic distortion figure. There it goes, it's plotting away. You can see it's hovering about zeros as you would expect for a very low distortion amplifier. Now this test is very useful. If I turn the volume up quite loud now so that we're pushing out say 100 watts, you'd see more distortion. And if you had any kind of problem with your amplifier, you would see all sorts of kinks and horrible artifacts on this curve which indicates that it's not being cleanly driven because at the high frequency of course um, it's having to respond much more quickly to the input so you would hear you know things like fuzzy drum beats and un uh, uh, symbols not being clear and that sort of hollow sound you get when the bass drum has been hit the actual hf parts of the drum with the big impressed upon the big impulse from the actual drum beat you'd get a horrible sort of trailing edge on it and distortion so it's a very good if you can hear any difference on an amplifier you think that doesn't sound quite right or it's sounding a bit off it will show up terribly on here it'll be all over the place because the human brain isn't that good at detecting this like an instrument would be okay so it's finished and then you can see here look you can see it's um thd plus the noise as well because the noise will come through as an un un unsolicited input signal of 0 0.11 all right at uh, 36 kilohertz so if we just zoom in on this zoom area yeah so you've got a total harmonic distortion of 0 0.1 percent with noise okay not great actually I wonder what the other channel does should we have a look at the other channel and see whether that is as bad that's surprising slightly that's quite surprising uh, track 2 let's try I'm testing the right channel now I've just changed it over Hmm.
What does that tell you? Near Houston, we've got a problem on our right channel. Sorry, the left channel. This is the right one now. Interesting, we've got a dip at about 170 hertz. There's obviously uh, something going on. Hmm. You can see they're both trending upwards at, towards the end of the frequency range, as you'd expect. But it's well above the actual audio fre audible frequency range anyway. But we've got 0.1% uh, versus 0.07%, uh, something like that. So it's 0.9 really, 0.09%, which is quite high because in the specification I think it says 0.01%. As I said, I will show you a much better amplifier that's much cheaper. This has got big knobs and very heavy construction, but it isn't up there with the uh, the best technology amplifiers. But having said that, it gives a lot of satisfaction to a lot of people, so I'm guessing it's worth it. So that's on the fringe. If this wasn't a sort of an audio file type amplifier, I wouldn't bother investigating that, really, uh, because you won't be able to hear it, frankly. Yeah, we're going to test the uh, phono response. The magnetic moving coil pickup is the pickup of choice for high fidelity and uh, as you can see it is an extremely the vinyl and the pickup is extremely non-linear in terms of the uh, what's supposed to be impressed on the vinyl to what is actually reproduced from the speakers and this is the curve from the musical fidelity user manual this is the claimed response curve of the phono and you can see down here at 20 Hertz you've got something like 17 dBs of gain and then it sweeps through and there's a slight kink in it here this is the actual these curves are the published curves for the uh, as agreed by the record industry and the audio industry to give the best reproduction of high quality vinyl record players or turntables with, with magnetic moving coil pickups so you can see the two curves there. there's two slightly different ones as they are IAA and the RIAA-IEC you can see the slightly different um, curve at the lower frequencies and so this amplifier has claimed to take the center line between those two i.e. a compromise between this and that to get the best from most records there's other videos on the on the internet that tell you about these two standards and how they diverged and where they originated from and it sweeps down and there's some various kinks and lines in it and this is part of the curve this is the requirement and goes down and then cuts off at about 18,000 Hertz at minus 20 dB okay so next to test is we're going to test this and just see what the phone inputs do for us all right so we're going to set up 20 Hertz 30,000 stop frequency we only need that to be 20,000 really so we'll go for five points per decade 10 millivolts and start yeah, ref level's okay. We've got a nice sine wave on the screen. Let's see what happens. Yeah, so that's the curve we get. And if we look in the manual here, so this is what it says on the uh, in the manual about the uh, phono response. The compensation, basically, the standard curve for a magnetic phono is to boost the lower frequencies and attenuate the higher frequencies up to about 18,000 and when it cuts off to minus 20 so remember 18,000 minus 20 in that general overall shape and you can see you've got the general overall shape you've got the kink in the middle as required there this part here which is that part there around about the 0 dB is around about a thousand Hertz now between a thousand and fifteen hundred maybe thirteen hundred Hertz so 0 dB is just on 1,000, which is about right. And then you see it rolls down to 16, that's 1,000, that's 16,000, that's 20,000. But 18,000 hertz is at minus 20. And uh, we've got minus 20 of 22 kilohertz. So we've got a bit more high frequency gain at the top end than there should be according to that curve in the manual. Both channels are the same, I've checked them. I'm not going to do anything about it. 
I don't know if that makes any difference to the actual subjective listening experience. I couldn't tell the difference. My ears are shot. But there's nothing much wrong with this amplifier. So I'm just going to look at that um, problem with the left channel and then uh, square it up and find out what the problem is. But that, see, basically sums up how we do the testing and evaluation of amplifiers after, during, and... Uh, but let's just do a power test and see what the power we were running at there. Because that's important. Actual absolute output power so here's the output power test it's a total harmonic distortion versus power so you can see how the uh, harmonic distortion tracks across the power output and also of course you can get the power level that you're working at so that should we go for 100 watts what do you think we've got four ohms clearly you've got to tell the analyzer what your load impedance is because it needs to do the calculation of the rms power based on the voltage being driven into the load we won't have any filters on. We're going to go for points per decade. We'll go for 10 again. Max TND, THD 1%. If it goes above 1%, the test will terminate because it's saying, well, you don't want to drive the thing crazy because if you drive it too crazy, say you've got the input level set too high, you can blow the amplifier up or do some damage. So it stops. All right, so let's start that. Well, here we go. So I think we're set a pretty low power actually. Here it comes. Here comes the power. There you can see the power coming as the amplitude increases. Now if that clips at all, the test will stop because the harmonic distortion will go above 1%, way above, but at the moment it's still climbing. And on the plot we've got, uh, oh, that's quite good isn't it? Place your bets ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, resistor's getting warm. 51 watts we're at. Okay, that's it, test done. So... We went up to, on that test run, we did, you can see it here on the corner of the screen, can you see that there? We did uh, 51.62 watts on that run, and we got a THD of 0.01%, which is pretty good, isn't it? So it's 1% distortion. Total harmonic distortion plus noise of 1%, which is given a slightly slight discrepancy on the other test, but the other one's a frequency versus power. This is power at 1 kilohertz, okay? Test frequency at 1 kilohertz. So if we just uh, turn the volume on the amplifier up slightly, get it to about there, maybe we can just get guess 100 watts. So let's just run test two, trace two. This one's with the volume turned up on the amp, so we'll get more power out of it. And you can see that the power is now starting off at just about 800 milliwatts because I turned the volume up. Fifty eight watts we've gone past where we were before. Ninety two watts. Hundred and forty six point eight watts. Two hundred and thirty two point seven watts. I can hear it. Oh, I've got distortion coming up, look we're overdriving it now. Whoa, you can see there you go, so there it's crapped out. <laughs> And it it it, it, uh, it bombed out. Look down here on the right hand side of the screen. It, <laughs> I think I turned the volume up too high there, guys. Yeah, look, we went up to 100, 200 watts, and then it started to climb at about 240, and then here it really started to clip. And the t harmonic distortion is one percent up there, and then it stopped. So at the top of the screen is one percent. So you can see the it went to um, THD of 17.3 percent because it clipped at 260 watts. Yeah. So yeah, 200 watts, 200 watt test. Oh Christ, they're really hot. Yeah, I think we've got sizzly resistors. I'm at my finger. Oh, do you hear that? Yeah, we stopped that just in time. <laughs> it's all off now, it's all stopped. Yeah, so there you have it. So in short, I would say nothing wrong with this amplifier slightly down on gain 
slightly up on well it's down on gain on the left channel and slightly up on harmonic distortion across versus frequency on on the left channel as well so the left channel is not working as well as the right channel so i'm just going to go back to the drawing board what i'll do is i will disconnect the input to the amplifier now, in this situation yeah so to check this out to isolate what's wrong with it we'll disconnect the cable to the amplifier which is this cable here on the left channel and feed a signal in to the amplifier direct from the analyzer and see whether it's the power amp that's failed or slightly off it could be crossover distortion or something and it made the bias adjusting we'll check that out and if the amplifier checks out okay and it's the same as this one then it's somewhere in this um, switching circuit and of course you've got a couple of op amps in here and uh, a switching analog switching channeling chip which does the multiplexing of all the inputs okay so you know it's not a great thing it's um it's reassuringly expensive but uh, a nice thing to own and give you a lot of satisfaction i should think um, but not if you look inside there are better amplifiers uh, for a lot less money towards the end of the uh, major sony um, amplifier range you know they're superb very similar design in terms of the output stages and things like that but they are absolutely incredible on the analyzer but as to whether my ears could tell the difference i couldn't honestly tell you i haven't sat in front of a pair of reference speakers for a while and my ears aren't that good so that's what we're going to do anyway i hope you enjoyed watching this if you um did then hit the subscribe button if you're not already subscribed and leave me a like that would be great and uh yeah lovely thing <laughs>